All right, here we are. Shift School Day 2. So I am so glad that you are here with me. And I hope that you are going to tag your friends, share this while it is live. And we'll have other people jumping on here with us. So I'm so glad to see uh, you here. I'm Nancy McCready, and I am redefining discipleship wherever God is opening the doors. And so a huge part of discipleship is that if you're going to grow and if you're going to mature, then you are going to be going through major shifts and they're major inside of you. They may not look like much to everybody else, but you and I know that the shifts inside of you are happening and they are intense and they are probably taking up a lot of your time, meaning that this is something that is ongoing. It's something that's happening in you pretty consistently and you are shifting. So again, welcome to Shift School Day 2. I'm Nancy McCready. Tonight, we want to look at, I hope that you'll go back and look at Day 1 and that you'll be able to check that out. It's posted and you can see that. But let's jump in and let's get going. Wow, look at all of you. And uh, I'm so glad that you're here with me. All right. So tonight, boy, am I looking forward to talking about what's gonna be on here tonight. I have so many things I wanna share with you about Shift School, and so I'm having to weed through every day to figure out exactly what are the things that I really wanna share. So tonight, this is what we're gonna talk about tonight. This is what we're gonna talk about day two, is you must steward, and Candace is gonna put this up on the screen as I go, you must steward your future, all right? You must steward your future. So now remember, shift, the definition of shift, this is shift school, the definition of shift, she'll put it back up on the screen, is shift is many small moves that result in a big move of God. And we don't wanna miss that, you know, big doors swing on little hinges. So again, these small moves, small decisions, small things that may be going on inside of you that don't look that big and you think you can continue to overlook them, but you cannot. You cannot afford to overlook things during seasons of shift and transition. So many small moves that result in a big move of God. So tonight's point, okay, and remember, this is school, so I'm not trying to rush, okay? <laughs> this is school. You can get live Facebooks that are two minutes long, 30 seconds long. This is school, all right? So I hope you've got something to take notes. We'll make the notes available to you later on, all right? But let's dive into this. So here is what we're looking at tonight, is in seasons of transition and shift, you and you alone, have to steward your future. Steward your future. Now let's look at what this word steward means. The word steward, it can be a noun, meaning it's a person who has oversight of someone's business affairs. But in this context, we're looking at you uh, stewarding as a verb, that it is what you do is that you manage or look after it, okay? No one else, is responsible as you mature and grow you, no one else is responsible for your future if you put it in the hands of other people and you're waiting for them to show up and you're waiting for them to make it happen you're hoping that you get that next prophetic word and someone else is going to ignite you into your future i'm here to tell you that you are going to steward your future you are going to have the responsibility of having oversight over it. Now, last night we talked about the fact that you are destined to receive an inheritance. There is a future. You can go back and listen to that uh, from last night. But listen to me. You and you alone, okay, are going to steward and manage and look after your future. You cannot continue 
to give it away to other people and hope that they do something, hope they have a word for you, hope they open a door, hope they do this or that. Now those things are true, but I'm talking about really taking greater responsibility for what goes on inside of your skin. What is going on inside of you? So you must steward your future even though someone else may have scarred your past. I'm gonna say this again. I did not make a slide for this, but I want you to listen. You must steward your future, even though someone else scarred your past, okay? And you do not determine this future, but you do discover it, all right? You don't determine your future, and Candace will put that up there, you don't determine your future, you discover it, okay? As you go with God, you are discovering, okay? You are discovering what God has always had written down. You are discovering it as you go with Him. And if there is one thing that I can really hope to make people hungry for, is I really want to make you hungry, okay? I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to make you so hungry. Now listen, when I get hungry, I'm not like pretty about it, okay? <laughs> Those of you that know me know I like to eat. And so when I talk about being hungry, I'm not just talking about, oh, you know, I'm so passionate and so hungry. No, I'm talking about you better feed me because I'm starting to get agitated. So oftentimes hunger and agitation and a little bit of frustration can begin to come. So I want you to be hungry. Listen to me carefully. I want you to be hungry, not for the life you should have had, could have had, would have had. I want you to be hungry for the life that God wrote down for you before the foundations of the world. That's what the word tells us. In Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, in the Amplified Classic, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, it says that he chose you out before the foundations of the world for himself in love, in Christ. That means that there is a life, a word, a uh, life with him, okay, that has been yours since before the foundations of the world. But if you're still wishing that you could have had the life that you should have had if you hadn't been abused or you hadn't been divorced or you hadn't had this, you hadn't had that, you're still pining away over something that you cannot recapture. But listen to me carefully. The life that he has for you with him, all right, the life that he has written down for you, that life is held in trust for you, just like a trust fund. It's held in trust for you. It's not diminished. It is not defiled by you or by anybody else. That has been held in trust for you in Christ. And you can bet that nobody is going to get inside of Christ and defile him. Therefore, they cannot defile you or your future if you live trusting in him and who you are in him. So I hope that you're going to get really hungry, kind of agitated, maybe a little ticked off, maybe, you know, you're going to get hungry for the life that he wrote down for you and stop wishing away your life. Because, you know, wishing and hoping are not the same as fighting. We're in the fight of faith for the life that he has for us. And we cannot spend our time just wishing and hoping. And wouldn't it have been nice? And gee, I wish that that hadn't happened because now because that happened, you know, I can't really have the future that God has for me. So I can't believe it's taken me this long to say this, but you know, plan A is still on. Plan A, what God wrote down. Now I'm not even talking about just all the specifics and the details of your life, okay? I'm talking about the fact of you and him together. Plan A to God, according to the scripture, is you and him in a maturing oneness together, okay? A maturing oneness together. You and he together. That, my friends, is held in security for you in Christ, and nobody can take that from you. So that's why I can say to you that you can steward your future, and that you can discover it, okay, and then you can steward it. 
All right, so you're on a discovery. You know, when I disciple people and mentor people and I encourage people and I meet with people, I tell them, you know, we're not here to, you know, make up a destiny for you, okay? All right, I'm not really the captain of my own destiny, but I am one who discovers, okay, the destiny that I have in him and with him. And so that is true also for you. Now, for you to steward this magnificent life that he has for you, okay? Hello to everybody. Wow, am I glad to see all of you. All right? Now, I want you to hold on, okay? Because we got some places to go tonight. This is school, in case anybody forgot, okay? This is school, all right? And we need to get schooled in things of the shift, Okay, the enemy wants to use times of shift when you're raw and tender and you feel clueless and you're not sure about things and, and you feel ridiculed and mocked and you, you're experiencing all manner of things. He wants to use this time to distract and get you off the path, get you taking the exit ramp. Now, this is about you staying during these times and watching God do something in you and through you and your decisions that you make out of your maturing and growing freedom. So, if you're going to steward your future, it is going to require you, my dear friends, to take new levels of responsibility for what is happening inside of you. All right? This is where everything that's going on inside of your skin, I want you to determine to make a decision in seasons of shift. I am going, I am going to take responsibility for what's going on inside of this skin right here. It's my responsibility, okay? You may have had other spiritual parents, people that have encouraged you, mentored you, discipled you, but there comes a time in seasons of shift, not that you run off from those people, but you begin to walk maybe differently with them in the fact that you appreciate their encouragement, but you begin to have a, if they've done a good job, you begin to have a strong sense that I think I'm going to need to take a little bit more responsibility for what's going on inside of me. Because you get to navigate your new. Okay? I love this. You get to navigate your new. Even, listen carefully, write it down, even if everybody else stays in their old. Mm, that is so good. I'm going to take me a cup of coffee because this is school. I got time to be able to do that. <laughs> mm, how about you? Mm, take a drink. Drink you some coffee. Think about this. You can navigate your new, even if everybody else stays in their old. Because one of the things that can happen during times of shift is, you know, God wants to move us forward. Never forget the word shift, movement, is because God loves to see his life in circulation. All right? Money is called currency. That's because God likes to see his wealth moving about. God is not stagnant. Life is about growth. Life is about moving forward, not frantically, not in a panic, not alarmed, not rushing about, not impulsive, but there is slow, steady, powerful progress in this growth process. So God wants to help us to move forward with him, okay? He's not looking to take you back anywhere you've been. He's taking you forward, okay? Hey, I'm so glad to see all of you. So even if everybody else stays in their old, okay, you can navigate your new because you're going to steward. You're going to have oversight of your future. You're not putting it in the hands of everybody else, hoping that they call on you, hoping that they do something, hoping that something. No, you begin to move forward and take greater responsibility for your life that he has put within you. So now listen to me. Okay, I got to slow down here just a little bit. Okay, you're going to navigate your new. Now here, if somebody else stays in their old, then here's what can happen. Okay, and this is getting ready to come up on the screen, is that your muscle memory is going to kick in. Because when everybody else is in their old, but God is telling you to navigate your new, what can happen is what is written right here, muscle memory. 
is where you go back to your previous ways and habits with very little effort. It's what they call default. But I like this word muscle memory because it, it says something to me that in these times when I am navigating my new, everybody else goes back to their old. Let's just say that we need to have new levels of maturing communication. But everybody else steps back and says, well, we're not going to talk about it. You know, we've never talked about those things. We're just not going to talk about that. And your temptation is, is to go back into your muscle memory, which is to be quiet, is to just sit, don't say anything, don't rock the boat. And yet here's God saying, hey, I want to move you forward in your levels of communication, the way that you address things, the way that you talk about things. You know, God's name is truth. All right, one of his names is truth. He believes in telling the truth. Now there's wisdom and timing in how you tell the truth, but God is not gonna be telling you, yeah, just sit back and choke it down and don't say anything because you know you don't wanna rock the boat. You don't wanna make anybody angry. You don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings. God's not gonna lead you in that way if he's maturing you, all right? And here's what can happen when it's time for you to navigate your new, okay? and everybody else is staying in their old, you're still responsible to do what? Navigate your new. So you, okay, cannot go into your old muscle memory, which automatically kicks in and says, well, if nobody else is saying anything, I'm not gonna say anything, okay? What if God is telling you that you're the one that is to speak forward? You're the one who needs to say something in love, in wisdom, in the proper timing, okay? But muscle memory can kick in when it's time for you to navigate your new and you go back without hardly even thinking about it, okay? It's just habit, boom, and you find yourself, three days later, you're bitter, you're angry, you're frustrated, you're having all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of things going on, the old is kind of back in charge. Well, God says that if we're going to navigate our new, then we've got to begin to take uh, true responsibility for what's going on inside of us. So one of the examples of this is if we continuously, okay, um, continue to hold on to anger and we continue to hold on to pains and irresponsibilities from our past, so one of the things that I know I had to look at is I, I know I was class clown. I know that I, you know, love to just look like I'm having lots of fun. But let me tell you, I was one ticked off person. I was angry. I had a lot of rage, but I was never comfortable dealing with it because you just don't rock the boat. You just have to keep all that in. You just have to keep all that down because if you ever speak up, what might happen? Well, people might leave you. People might. So listen, now, you know what that means? If you flip that thinking, that means I've got to keep quiet to keep people around. I, I could almost take another cup of coffee right now, another sip of coffee. Okay? <laughs> I mean, just think about this. Is that if you've got to choke it down and you've got to make sure that you never get angry and don't say anything and keep it all in, then what you're thinking is is that I have to behave so that people will stay around me. If I speak up, they might leave. And how many of you know that's very true? They surely might. But is it actually your responsibility to try to control everyone else? Or is it in navigating the new, your responsibility to take care of you? Navigate the new for you, okay? So, here's one of the things that I used to, to think, you know, is that other people just make me so mad. So what I was saying, okay, was that other people make me angry, okay? So if they make me mad, how many of you know you're going to have to wait around for them to make you happy? And so you've put other people in charge of you. And actually, you've given them power over your life. Now listen, this is not God's way. So in times of shift and times of transition, guess what God might begin to deal with, okay? This is just an example, okay? Guess what God might begin to deal with is that he might begin to start touching on these things 
And he, he may be encouraging you to speak up and to share and to, you know, and you're like, God, I can't do it because they're going to get mad. And if he talks to you like he talks to me, he might say, and, <laughs> you know, because he had, to, he had to challenge me for me to begin to really look at is that I really believed it was my job to manage other people and their emotions. And I was always, you know, my survival skills were honed so highly that I'm picking up on what everybody else is thinking in the room and what they're doing, making sure, you know. So therefore, I'm completely unaware of what I'm actually feeling until I get into seasons of shift and then God begins to stir things that are already in me. And in one of the seasons of shift in my life, God had to begin to show me that uh, others might knock up against me and stir up the anger that's already in me. Hmm? They're stirring up the anger that's already in me because if they make me mad and they make me happy, well, I've got to keep them around. And so in very subtle ways, sometimes we don't realize that we are thinking that somehow, you know, I've got to manage all these other people, so therefore, who is managing me? All right? And so this is where, again, in our shift and in our times of transition, nobody else may know all this is going on, but it's all happening inside of you, is that we have put other people in charge of us, but God says that it's time for me to take responsibility for what he's doing in me, for the life that he's given me. You know, Jesus came, he died, he rose again, he has ascended, sits at the Father's right hand. He's poured out the Holy Spirit who put his new life inside of me. And I am now given to have responsibility, okay, for how I am going to live that life. Am I going to allow him to lead me or am I going to be new but I keep living in the old? So this is why navigating the new is so important, even if everybody else stays in the old. Now, it can be uncomfortable, okay? It can be difficult. That's why we chose the old in the first place is because it was difficult and it was hard, but we are no longer children. So I don't have this scripture, all right, but I want to... Um, mention it is that in the scripture we've probably all heard where it says that uh, you know when I was a child I thought like a child I behaved like a child I reasoned like a child I believe it's first Corinthians 13 please forgive me if it's not because I don't have it in my notes but first Corinthians 13 I think 11 through 13 and it says that when I was a child I thought like a child I behaved like a child I reasoned like a child but now that I am a man I put away childish things. This is gonna be a part of what I'm gonna uh, school you in tonight, is this putting away of childish things. Now, I don't think I would be misusing the scripture uh, if I said it this way, since it's the Apostle Paul speaking and he talks about the new man, is that when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, I behaved like a child. But now that I am the new man, I and I alone must put away childish things. Now here is what the put away words mean, cartesio. Uh, I think that's the way it's pronounced in the Greek. This is what those two words mean. To put away means to fire them. They're no longer employable. I no longer need their services. I do not need those things now because I am a new man. I am the person that God made me to be. And if I'm going to live that life, I'm going to have to put on Christ. I'm going to have to put on Christ. Okay? So we put away childish things. Now this takes time. Okay? We put away childish things and we put on Christ. And we can put him on because we are in him and he is in us. The words put on Christ mean to dive in, plunge into the deep, and then learn to rest in it. Okay? So do you see that these, these dual things are going on in this unbelievable discipleship maturing growth process? This is why I'm talking about redefining discipleship. 
This isn't just I did my Bible study and I filled in all my blanks in my workbook and I know where all the books of the Bible are. And, you know, those things are all good. And those are things in the beginnings of discipleship. But redefining discipleship is what God meant when he said through Jesus Christ is, if any man would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me to live like me. So to me, discipleship is sonship. I follow the son so that I can learn to live as a son, not as a nice Christian, not just trying to get by, but to literally live as God meant for me to live. That's why the new that you're navigating is very, very powerful. The new that you're navigating, the future that you're going to steward and have oversight of is phenomenal and is very, very powerful. All right. So we can't abdicate our responsibility for that. Okay. So yeah, they may have made me mad. Okay. Does that mean I've got to stand around and wait for them to come back and make me happy? And what I'm really saying when I say that, okay, because I want you to see the conversation going on inside the conversation. All right. Is basically is I, I'm going to require other people to be more mature than me. Hmm? They need to they need to come back and do something. You know, not me. You know. They need to do something. No, no, no. God's called me, me, in my personal obedience to him. You see, those things, this kind of thinking right here, that's immature. That's a childish way. That is a childish way, is that I'm going to need to take responsibility. If I'm going to put away childish things and I'm going to put on Christ, is I don't walk around, everybody else can jerk my chain and can make me mad or make me happy. I'm waiting for my soulmate to show up. I'm waiting for my BFF. I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for that. Hoping all these different people are going to show up in my life. And then it would be so awesome because they would make me feel so wonderful. God says, I'm getting ready to wean you. Okay, now listen, these are strong words. Get ready to wean you off of all of that. Get you off the bottle and onto the meat. And when you're being weaned off of something, okay, it's a good thing because you're going now into eating the food of the mature. All right? So I hope you're staying with me. Oh, yes, you are. I am loving this. People adding on. This is great. All right? Now listen. So if you're going to steward your future, you're going to navigate your new, uh, one of the scriptures that I would encourage you to look at is James 4, uh, I encourage you to look at James 4, 1 through 5, but I'm only going to briefly mention James 4, 1 through 2, and it'll be here on the screen. James 4, 1 through 2 out of the Amplified Classic. It says, What leads to strife and feuds and discord among you? And how do conflicts originate among you? So it's saying in the scripture, James 4, 1 and 2, it's saying what leads to all this fighting and all this anger and all these uh, quarrels that are going on, okay? This is what it says. Do they not arise? Now, it's not on the screen right now. Don't let that bother you. You can look it up in your Bible, okay? All right? It says, do they not arise from your, your sensual desires that are ever warring in your bodily members. Verse 2, you are jealous and covet what others have. Okay, I don't know if y'all notice this pattern, but it's focusing on what's going on inside of you and inside of me. Now, there may be quarrels and fighting and conflicts going on among you and someone else, but it begins to address what is going on inside of you. If you want to know how these things originate, if you want to know what is really making you mad, if you want to know what's going on, the Word says, look within yourself. Now, Holy Spirit is going to be the one who really begins to show you these things. I don't really encourage people to go digging up in themselves trying to figure it out because most of us are either going to be too hard on ourselves or too soft. Holy Spirit, boom, he hits the bullseye every time. So I strongly encourage you to stay with him. All right, so let me remind you to be sharing this broadcast while we're doing it. Encourage others to hop on with us and book in and stay with us, okay, the whole time. All right, so I appreciate it so very, very much. All right, so... 
Here we go, James 4. Now we're going into verse 2. It says, you, oh, I can't believe this pattern. It's always pointing to me. I'm wanting to say, no, they made me mad. But the Bible says, you are jealous and covet what others have. And your desires go unfulfilled. Now, pay attention. Pay attention to that. Your desires are going unfulfilled. So you become murderers. This is serious business. To hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. You burn, burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification, the contentment, and the happiness that you seek. So you fight and war. Now, sometimes, I know none of y'all probably were like me, but used to, I didn't even need anybody else to be in the room for me to be having an argument. I could be fighting with my husband all day long. He wasn't even there. I'm having that argument inside myself. He's going to say this, and I say this, and he says that. And there's all this strife going on inside of me. He's not anywhere around, okay? Because all this goes on inside of us. Now, then they walk in the door, right? And then you go, and another thing. And they're like, what? I didn't even know we were having an argument, okay? All right, but here's what it says. When you boil it down, okay? He says, you wanna know why all these quarrels and fightings and feuds are going on? Why you're having such difficulty? Why there's strife? Why all of that is happening? It says, because there's something you want and you can't get it. Hmm? You might want to write that down, all right? If I, when I start sensing, when I become aware that I'm agitated, that I'm angry, that I'm hurt, that I'm bitter, that I'm offended, whatever it may be, okay? Or when I'm afraid, it's saying, it's because there's something that you desire, but that desire is going unfulfilled. There's something that you want Okay? Now, when you're a kid, that could be, I want to stay up late, I want to watch TV, and they don't let you, and you pout, and you pitch a fit, and you roll around on the floor, okay? All right? But when you get older, it could be that someone has not respected you in the boardroom. They did not do for you what you wanted them to do. They did not call you. They did not speak to you as they walked down the hall at church. I don't care how minor or major that it is, at the core, if we're gonna believe what the Word of God says, is that nobody else made me mad. This originated within me because there's a war that's going on inside of me and I am not getting what I want. I'm not getting the gratification. I'm not getting the contentment. I am not getting what I want and I am angry about it. Now, all of a sudden, boom, I'm angry. Whew, I can feel it like someone has literally lit a match and thrown it inside of me. I'm lit up, okay? I'm angry. But, but you know, when I was younger, if you were angry and you showed it, you got in trouble. You got hit. You got yelled at. You got put to bed early, whatever it may have been. And so you, okay, developed those mechanisms to where, no, don't say that you're angry because if you get angry, you get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So guess what happens is, is that your old shows up, your muscle memory shows up, and you start shutting down. But listen to me carefully. That fire, that burning inside of you is still present. And it can churn and burn for days on end. But you're like, well, but I can't say anything, you know, because they get upset. You can't tell anybody anything, you know, because... Now, I'm going to really show myself here, okay? I'm going to really show myself, and I'm going to tell you that I honestly believed, okay, that I could not speak uh, what uh, I was really thinking. You, you have to keep it in, you know, because other people get so upset. And especially when it came to people in authority, because I really had an attitude deep down inside, all right, that got... God had to flush it out during a time of deep shift and transition for me, is that I really considered that to be a weakness on their part. 
So I have to keep quiet. I can't say anything because they get so upset. They get so emotional. You know, they can't handle the truth. So I'm going to have to choke it down so that they don't get upset. And deep down within me, I really was quite disgusted at their weakness. Are you with me? I was disgusted at other people's weakness. So then later on in life, okay, I'm like, okay, they can't handle anything. I'm going to have to handle it, okay? I see some of my friends on there telling me, come on, okay? All right. All right. Is that I really was quite disgusted at their weakness because I can't say anything because they can't handle the truth, okay? Well, God had to deal with me, all right? Because even though, um, even though early in life, those things got deeply ingrained, and listen to me, the things that get deeply ingrained and deeply embedded in you when you're younger, they get flushed out when you're older and in you're in times of shift and transition. Why? Because what are you shifting to? What are you transitioning to? But a greater maturing oneness with the Father. That is why Jesus came. That is why the promise of the Father, Holy Spirit, was poured out inside of you. The very first part of it is the, the thing they count of the most importance is what Jesus prayed in John 17, is maturing oneness, okay? Maturing oneness with them. That's what they want, okay? But let me tell you what, that's what you're shifting into, but your flesh, the independent ways that we learn to handle our anger, our disappointment, our rejection, those things will not fellowship with the Father. That is why flesh has to be dealt with. Not because it's bad behavior, but because it won't go with Him. It will not fellowship with Him, okay? So we have to recognize that um, flesh has been trying to control the environment, control other people, keep them at a distance, trying to keep us protected and isolated and insulated so that we are not hurt further. But listen, if we're going to mature, those things cannot remain. Why? Because they're childish things and they must be put away. Put away childish things, okay, because now you are a man. You are the new man. You are growing. You are shifting. You are transitioning. And so we want to make sure that that's what's actually happening. So these things cannot remain. And they're different for each one of you. I understand that. And I'm, so I'm trying to be careful in the examples that I'm using. But listen, when we're younger, okay, life spins us around. Okay, it's kind of like the old game, Pin the tail on the donkey. I hope some of y'all are not too young to not know what I'm talking about. But to pin the tail on the donkey is they would blindfold you, they would spin you around, okay? And then you had to try to, you know, even though you were disoriented, you had to try to find, okay, and pin the tail on the donkey. Well, this is a part of what I think of when I think about putting blame on other people. Rather than me taking responsibility for what goes on inside of me, Letting God begin to deal with me and mature me is that it's like I'm still trying to find the donkey to pin the tail on because I'm going to find somebody to blame, some excuse to make, you know, well, I can't do anything about that, you know, because this person over here does this and this person just agitates me and this person irritates me, but I'm not willing to deal with it. Well, then that's your decision that you have chosen. It is not the other person that's keeping you where you are. It's you and it's me. And God loves us so much and wants us to grow in maturing oneness with him that he's going to come and he's going to deal with it. All right? But what happens is, is that if we are victims in our bitterness and in our anger because nobody did for me then and nobody's doing for me now, I'm always getting the short end of the stick, this and that is happening. And here's what happens is victims, okay, I mean, it was embarrassing a little bit for me, for me to have to realize how much of a victim mentality was still deeply ingrained in me because, you know, others make me mad. I'm the victim of their anger. I'm the victim of their weakness. I'm the, victor, the victim of their choices. But no, I am not. No, I am not. And no, you are not either any longer if you are in Christ. 
but victims still need, feel the need to prove someone else is wrong. They need to make sure because they keep the storyline, the narrative going on inside of them that they talked to themselves when they were younger. The mantra of a victim is, did you see what happened to me? Can you believe what happened to me? I can't believe that happened to me. Did you see what they did? Did you see? Someone needs to see it. And we don't understand sometimes why this incessant victim chatter goes on inside of us so deeply is that we're still trying to prove, does anybody see what happened to me? Does anybody recognize that something happened to me? I am the victim of someone else. And so we talk about it and we talk about it. Now, eventually, people around us might say, you need to stop talking about it. So we do stop talking about it outwardly. <laughs> but we don't stop talking about it inwardly. We keep letting that victim chatter go on inside of us and it keeps working and working and working in us. But listen to me carefully. As long as you are living in a victim mentality, you are more offended by what has happened to you than what is coming out of you. Yep, I'm getting ready to have some coffee. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. When you choose to remain a victim rather than stewarding your own future, what you begin to do okay, is you, um, you are rehearsing what's happened to you. You are requiring greater obedience and maturity from other people than you are from yourself. And what happens is, is that when you are a uh, victim, you are focused on other people and what they have done. And you're highly offended at what they are doing. But do you see this here? Maturity is often preceded Okay, that means this is going to come before the maturity can happen. Is often preceded by being more offended when you finally become, by the Holy Spirit's work in you, that you become more offended at what is coming out of you rather than what is coming against you. The day that Holy Spirit granted unto me that I could be more offended by the fact that I wished people did. I wished them away. I wanted harm to come to them. I gossiped about them. I bad-mouthed them. I was critical. I was judgmental. I was disrespectful in the way that I thought about them privately where nobody else could see. I'm, I'm telling on myself. Now, I hope this helps somebody because I don't need to go around telling on myself just to tell. I'm hoping that this will help you. This is what was rooting around in me over and over and over again, okay? And finally, Holy Spirit was able to break through, able to break through in me so that I could begin to live the life that he called me to. He granted to me a grief that he meant for me to feel. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10 in the Amplified Classic. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10 in the Amplified Classic says, There is a pain, there is a grief that God means for me to feel. That, and if I will let him direct that pain, it will lead me to salvation, deliverance, and with it will come no regret. It's called repentance. It is a gift. And in those deep moments where he grants unto you repentance in times of deep shifting and deep transition because you've got to grow up and we've got to grow up in Christ and you don't have to grow yourself up. Holy Spirit will grow you up and he will mature you and it takes time to transition from I got to put away the childish and I'm putting on Christ. This is the process of discipleship of growing up into the fully mature sons that the Father has always wanted, is that we are those who begin to say, you know what, I'm no longer going to be in charge of my own pain management. All right? Now, I'm going to continue some of this tomorrow at noon and then on Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Thursday night, okay? Because to me, this is there, there are many things I could talk with you about. But I'm telling you, this is the stuff that keeps us chained, like on a choker hold, in things of our past. And we do not mature 
in the Lord because we don't take the provision of our Father at the cross of Jesus Christ to deal with our pain, with our anger, with our rage, with our, our hurt, okay, with our self-indulgence and all that comes with it, all right? And it's so important that we allow Him to begin to direct our pain. And He grants unto us an entirely new way of seeing things where we finally become more offended, okay, at what is coming out of us than what is just coming against us. If you're still at the place that you are constantly offended by what other people do, I'm going to be praying for you that you get a big dose of the Holy Spirit and He begins to help you to be offended with what is coming out of you. Yes, someone may have sinned against me, but in return, I am now sinning against God, sinning against myself, and sinning against that person. How offended am I about that? Or have I gone back to my muscle memory and I feel very justified? I feel completely within my rights to do that as a Christian. And so this is why um, I'm bringing this up in shift school is because we can study and we can preach and we can teach and we can serve and we can do that and we can try to live as a nice person. But listen, that's not the goal of Christianity. That's not the goal of discipleship. Discipleship is I'm going to follow Jesus because I plan on living like Jesus by his very life within me. I am going to let God deal with my anger, my rage, my bitterness, my resentment. I'm not going to keep those things hidden. I'm not going to keep them, you know, hidden away and embedded and, and just trying to ignore those things. Because I'm going to tell you what, they're paying close attention to you, okay? And those things are going to fester because they don't just stay where they begin. They grow and they consume you. And God wants to route those things out and deal with them by the power of the cross. So we want to be those. I, I am asking God, do not let me again become more offended with what others are doing than I am with my own self. All right? And so this is a part of maturing is finally I go, whoa, I'm over here furious with this person, angry about them, having horrible thoughts about them. But that's not bothering me. What they did is bothering me. And so again, don't try to do this to yourself. This is something Holy Spirit brings to you and works in you. All right, so as we're getting ready, because I can tell that I'm going to need to finish this up over the next couple of days of shift school. All right, but I'm hoping that this is provoking you into the process of growing up. I love to do things that provoke us into process. Not just like, oh, hey, Nancy, that was a great word. Those were great things that you shared. I'm like, what? That's not what I'm sharing it for. I want to provoke you. I want there to be a hunger within you for you to take those next steps and begin to go with God in what it is that he's doing in these deep seasons of shift and transition. You may be in shift and transition because of tragedy, because of someone that you loved has passed away. You may be in times of shift and transition in your job, in, in things of, of maturing and letting go of a codependent toxic relationship and moving deeper into navigating your new normal that God is moving you into. It can come in so many different ways. And I want you to be provoked in the process. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to have understanding that I know only Holy Spirit can give you. But he does use us. And so I am hoping that this is going to help you in the days to come. Because we must recognize, okay, that God wants to deal with uh, the foundations of our prison. God wants to deal with the things that would keep us trapped. And he's not going to do that by fixing someone else. He told me years ago, Nancy, I will not fix you by fixing someone else. 
I'm not going to make them behave so that you'll be okay. He said, you come closer to me and whatever ails you, I am going to deal with it. Ooh, it got so personal. It was uncomfortable for me, but, but I knew that when he spoke, he was granting unto me repentance and I was able to go with him because of what he was doing in me. And so I have many other things that I could share, but I don't want to go too long because I want to make sure that you'll join me again tomorrow and the next day because this is our five days of shift school. So I want you to be encouraged, all right, that God is taking you into your future. I know it doesn't look probably anything like you thought that it was going to look. That's one of the things that happens during shift and transition. Sometimes we think, I had no idea it was going to look like this. And so God begins to work in you, okay? How about we end on this tonight? is that God is working on you, all right? Not because you're to blame for everything. Don't let those old muscle memory thoughts come back in as they, it's me, it's always me. No, no, no. No, what God is doing is God wants you, thank you, Zeta, for saying this. He wants us to come closer to him. There are things he is gonna share with you. When he begins to reveal things to you that are going on inside of you, okay? like in James 4, 1 through 5. He wants to show you the things that are going on inside of you because he plans on setting you free from those things. And then you're able to navigate your new and step into your new and move into your future no matter what anybody else is doing because you're not a victim of everybody else. But you surely don't want to be a victim of your own self. You surely don't want to stay in those childish things, right? It's time to come out of the bumper pads, right? It's time to begin to be courageous, truly courageous in this time, and to begin to ask him, Father, mature me. Father, show me things that before used to just trigger me off and I couldn't handle it, but Father, if there are conversations that you want to have with me, I think I might be more ready than ever before to have those conversations, for you to speak with me, Father, in the way that you want to, to be able to tell me, Father, things that I have not known, places where I have continued to think in ways and to want other people to do right, and yet I wasn't requiring of myself to do that which you are leading me to do. So this is a part of deep shift. This is a part of stepping in to that which is yours by inheritance. Remember the scripture from our time before in Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, when it talked about Abraham, that even though he was completely ignorant of where he was going, he was destined to possess his inheritance. So you are destined to possess the life that Christ died, rose again, okay, to put inside of you. That's your real life. That's who you are. And nothing, nothing can take that life away from you. Now, you can forfeit it. You can ignore it. You can let it just lay there and not have any impact on you whatsoever. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I want you to be encouraged to take hold of the life that he has for you. And when you decide, I'm going to steward my future, okay, I'm going to navigate my new as I learn to lean into the Lord and depend upon him more and more and more, more than I ever have before. Father, I'm going to let you raise me. I'm going to let you grow me up. I'm going to let you mature me. And Father, if that means that I've got to be more offended by what comes out of me than what's coming against me, then so be it. Let's get on with it. Okay? So... I hope that tonight has provoked you, it has encouraged you, it's opened up the eyes of your understanding that you begin to recognize some of the things that are going on inside of you, all right? The reason you can't get any you know, help or satisfaction from anybody and, and God's not answering all your prayers that are asking him to fix everybody else, I hope this is helping you to recognize, hmm, God is actually answering my prayer just in a way that I never, uh, I never maybe anticipated because this is times of shift and transition, and we gotta hold on to him and cling to him and take hold of what it is that he's doing. 
because he can set you free. And let me tell you, the greatest deliverance you'll ever experience <laughs> is from yourself. That's the greatest deliverance you'll ever know. All right? So I want you to be encouraged. Think on these things. Go back over this. Listen to it again. All right? And to uh, in our next two times together in Shift School, I'm going to go deeper into this, and we're going to explore how we begin to get unhooked from all of these things that keep us bound in a victim mentality, and we stay immature, but uh, I believe that God can show us how it is that He is going to help us to begin to shift and move with Him, and life is going to be in circulation, okay? All right, so thank you to all of you that were with me tonight for Shift School Day 2, and I will look forward to seeing you next time. It will be noon tomorrow, Central Standard Time, Noon tomorrow, we'll be live again, and we will continue. I know many of you will be at work. It'll be a different time of day, so maybe you won't be able to be with us live, but make sure that you get in and check it out later on when we repost it, okay? This is Nancy McCready, Redefining Discipleship, wherever God is opening the doors. Please know that you can touch base with us via the comments. We'll be looking at them afterwards. You can go to nancymccready.com. You can send me an email. You can become a partner with Nancy McCready Ministries. You can access some resources there. Uh, if you're looking for someone to come and speak or to do your conference or whatever that may be, there's opportunity for you to send me an email there. But we want to make sure that we're getting truth to you, that you have the opportunity to be encouraged and get some understanding about the wild time that goes on when we are shifting. So I will see you next time. And don't forget, you can steward your future. You can navigate your new, even if everybody else stays in the old. God is at work in you, and I'm praying for you. All right? I'll talk to you soon. Bye.